these natural disasters. But if you look and examine them in and of themselves, they are natural occurrences that have their own causes and their own benefits. But when you bring them relative to other things, you can start to say this is relatively evil because it leads to these people dying. This is relatively evil because it causes this type of destruction or infrastructure and so on and so forth. This is one form of evil, relative evil. And then there's some evil which is the realest that evil can ever get. And that's the evil of our choices. The realest that evil can ever get is when we have a choice between doing what is right and doing what is wrong. And with our agency, with our free will, we choose to take the path of ingratitude. God Almighty has inspired the human being, has given him a choice, has showed him the way to either be grateful, thankful, appreciative of the blessings that he has given, or to cover up the truth, to hide that blessing, to hide the due appreciation for that blessing. And that is when we make the wrong choices. The realest that evil can get is an evil choice. God empowered us with free will, which is a beautiful thing. Who would not want to have the freedom to make his or her own choices? Who would prefer to simply be a robot that merely functions by virtue of its programming? No. None of us would, deep down, want to be controlled like a robot. Rather, the ability to make our choices with our own responsibility attached is what makes them worthwhile, what makes us feel like we are free, what makes us responsible for our choices. And that has a tax, dear brothers and sisters. I say to you all in this holy month of Ramadan, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. It comes with a tax. It's not for free. When you're able to make a good choice, that means you were able to abandon a bad one. The ability to make the right choice, it means that we have the ability to make the wrong one. Whose responsibility is it if we make a wrong choice? Is it God's responsibility that He gave us the freedom? He did a good thing by giving us freedom, if you think about it. But naturally, by virtue of us having freedom, human beings can do very terrible things. And that is why I seek refuge with God from every form of evil, especially the evil of my own choices. As I begin in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one beyond all that you see, who is here, but not in one specific place. Who is different from his creatures, but they can never escape him. The one who is completely independent, and upon him everything else relies. Whenever I reflect on my own experiences and I feel a point of weakness, or a deficiency. At any point in my life, when I feel fear, when I feel weakness, when I feel need, when I feel like I don't have something, that I need to work for something, when I feel sick, when I feel deep down inside of me, I feel that there's somebody else that I am in need of. That feeling even before the thought, that feeling is us reaching out to God. Hopefully in these coming nights with the holy blessings of this month, we'll be able to reflect together on the realities of the way we see the world. But not only through our thoughts, through our feelings, through connecting to the way that Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, used to speak to God. You saw an example in Dua al-Iftitah. 
in these special nights of Qadr, these special nights, which has been variably translated as nights of power, nights of destiny, nights of ordainment, the idea of there's a special significance to the night of Qadr, which is mentioned in the Holy Quran, as you all know in Surah Al-Qadr, as better than a thousand months. It is a night in which the different apportionments, the different ordainments for our worldly life for the coming year are apportioned, they're given, they're distributed. These commands descend upon the one who receives that Amr, which we'll talk a little bit about also. In these nights, one of the most important acts relates to our worship of God. How we connect to God, how we relate to God, how we speak to God. But the thing is, how do we go from simply saying the words to actually feeling the meaning of the words? To experience the dua as it was intended? To experience it not merely as an act, as a ritual. Not merely as an act that you perform out of a sense of, well, God wants this, so I'll do it, regardless whether I reach the essence of what it means or not. That's a noble thing, to do it something out of devotion. Some people may find that committing to the prescription that Islam offers for us, this prescription of spiritual health, they may not understand everything about it. Why do we have to pray this many units in the morning prayer as opposed to another number of units in the evening prayer? Why do we have to make sure that we don't shake hands with the opposite gender even if we know we don't have any ill intentions? Why do we have to put on the hijab in this way? Why can't we just be modest in our dress in other ways? Why do we have to commit to this particular month of fasting, as opposed to just fasting whenever we feel that spiritual connection in another month. You may answer, well, obviously, we just do what God wants us to do out of devotion. I comment on that, and that's a, that's a noble thing to do. That's great. But the question is, do we stop there? Yes. When it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we take God's word for it and we may not understand all of the dimensions behind what we're doing, but we know that God is the expert on this issue. He knows what is best for us and we take God's word for it. But was that what was meant when the Imams taught us these special supplications? I don't claim to have reached much in, in the sense that I'm talking about. But I do know that even if we're able to taste just a bit, just a little sip of the ocean that Ahlul Bayt were trying to relate to us, even if we just get a little taste, it can change our lives. It can make the difference between saying in Dua al Jawshan when you say, Subhanaka ya la ilaha illa ant, al ghawth al ghawth, khallisna min al nar ya rab. Praise be to you, O oh God. You're asking God to rescue you, to save you. Save us from the fire of hell, O oh Lord. There's a joke that some, some would say about this phrase, that some people, when they're reading this dua, they're not actually in their heart saying, save us from the fire of hell. They're saying, save us from this dua. Let us finish this dua quickly. <laughs> the idea behind this kind of humor is to reflect on do we get even a little bit of the taste of the dua or are we just reading it and that's what I hope we can touch on together as we reflect together and contemplate together in these nights we'll realize that sometimes you may be repeating the same words you've said many many years you may even say them on a daily basis but when we contemplate on them together, hopefully with a special blessing from God and the intercession of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, it may touch us in a very different way that will leave an imprint on us for the rest of our lives, inshaAllah. I wanted to quickly comment before I get into Munajat Amir al muminin and hopefully we'll be reading, reading this after. I wanted to start talking about 
this munajat. In this munajat, before I get to that, I wanted to comment quickly on the significance of Laylatul Qadr and preparing ourselves for Laylatul Qadr. As you know, the Holy Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna anzalna hu fi Laylatul Qadr. Wa ma adraka ma Laylatul Qadr. ليلة القدر خير من ألف شهر تنزل الملائكة والروح فيها بإذن ربهم من كل أمر سلام هي حتى مطلع الفجر The night of Qadr This night which is better than a thousand months According to some reports from Ahl al-Bayt, that doing good in this month, in this, in this night, is better than doing the equivalent over a thousand months. And another verse in the Qur'an, it mentions how the Holy Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan. According to the, the exegesis, the tafsir, in this surah, Surah Al-Qadr, we have revealed it, we have brought it down on the night of Qadr, that is the Qur'an. Many of the, the key tafasir of this verse described that there were two stages in which the Qur'an was revealed. One, as, an, as a kind of holistic revelation upon the heart of the greatest of God's messengers, the seal of all prophets, Rasulullah Muhammad, this was all at once on Laylatul Qadr. And then gradually throughout his life, depending on the circumstances, when it was the occasion to explain the right verse at the right time, it would start to be revealed in that gradual fashion. Another verse which you read in Surah Dukhan, it's part of the a'mal of some of these nights to read Surah Al-Dukhan. You see that it talks about a special amr, command. فِيهَا يُفْرَقُ كُلُّ أَمْرٍ حَكِيمٍ That is basically, there is something that is being channeled from up above, from up above in the upper realms, down, delivered onto earth in this special night. According to Tafsir Al-Mizan, this command is the command of God. But it's not merely an issue of the legislation. It's not merely an issue of giving orders. It's actually a reflection of a reality in creation. A reality of God delivering the command for the rest of creation. What will be ordained for the coming year. And the reports of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, confirm that this is something that is a recurring incident every year. Some reports of Ahl al-Bayt mention the significance of not only the eve of the 23rd, which many in our communities have come to think of as the night of power, the, the night of Qadr. Actually, there are indications that there's an important role for each of these nights. It's kind of like, if you look into the idea that is mentioned, you see it's kind of like there's a, there are stages. You prepare the grounds for the end sealing of the deal by what you do in the previous nights. And in some reports, it may even indicate that even what we've done on the eve of 15th of Sha'ban may have an impact on what's going to happen in later in the year. But there's a special emphasis in the reports of Ahlul Bayt on the eve of the 21st and the eve of the 23rd. And I don't know if you have been following, but recently there has been kind of new, new kind of, it's been new, newly brought to the attention of some of our jurors the question of when is Laylatul Qadr? Some were saying that, okay, Sayyid al Khui says that it's known to be Qudis uh, al it's known to be on the eve of the 23rd. So they asked Sayyid Sistina's office recently, may God protect him and protect all of Maraja. And he answered basically that this idea that it's between the 21st Eve and the 23rd Eve. And there's an indication in some reports that, oh how easy, 
or how small of an effort it is to worship God or to do good in these two eves, these two nights, in the face of what you're asking for, in the face of what is at stake, in the face of how much is at stake, to just sacrifice two hours or a few, two, two nights of our time for what is at stake, it's very little. So hopefully we can take advantage of this opportunity. It's been reported that Lady Fatima alayhi salam as has been relayed in the Alam al-Islam by Al-Qadi Nu'man al-Maghribi and has also been kind of referenced after that in many of the contemporary sources as you find in Mafatih al-Jinan it says أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يطوي فراشه ويشد مئزره في العشر الأواخر من شهر رمضان. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to dedicate himself to worship in a special way during the last ten days of the month of Ramadan. وكان يوقد أهله ليلة ثلاث وعشرين. And he used to wake up his family on the eve of the twenty-third. وكان يرش وجوه النيام بالماء في تلك الليلة. And he used to sprinkle water in a kind and gentle way on the faces of those who were sleeping so that they would awake, awaken for worship in this night. وَكَانَتْ فَاطِمَ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامِ لَا تَدَعُ أَحَدًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا يَنَامُ تِلْكَ اللَّيْنَ And Lady Fatima, peace be upon her, would not leave any one of her family to sleep on this night. She would encourage them and urge them to wake up and worship on that night. وَتُدَاوِيهِمْ بِقِلَّةِ الطَّعَامِ وَتَتَأَهَّبُ لَهَا مِنَ النَّهَارِ And she would make that easy upon them. She would help them to do so by giving them, making, reducing the amount of food that she would feed them. Minimizing the amount of food because perhaps it has an impact on our ability to stay up at night or to focus in our prayers and worship. وَتَتَأَهَّبُ لَهَا مِنَ النَّهَارِ According to Sheikh Al-Qummi, Sheikh Abbas Al-Qummi and Mufatih Al-Jinan, he explains this to mean that she would have them rest during the daytime, sleep during the daytime so that they would be able to stay up at night. So these are things that we should keep in mind if we were able to, to do that for this night, at least for the coming nights, insha'Allah. وَتَقُولْ مَحْرُومٌ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا And she would say, deprived is the one who has been deprived of its virtue or its goodness. The good in this night. Truly deprived is the one who has been deprived of it. So let's hopefully, inshallah, take heed of this reminder attributed to Lady Fatima alayhi salam as we remember all of the believers across the globe in these nights of worship. Quick also reminder, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at the, last, the sermon of the Prophet sallallahu in welcoming the month of Ramadan this year. If you've already thought about it or taken a look at it this year, please give me a show of hands just so I get a sense. If you've been able to take a look at the khutbah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in welcoming the month of Ramadan this year. Oh. Alhamdulillah. So I think it would be useful to just as a reminder, keep in mind that this month, the entire month, is a month of special deals. We have special offers going out throughout the whole month. This counts. It's as good as it can get, inshallah, unless there are special exceptional opportunities in other parts of the year. But it's been mentioned in some reports that if a person is not forgiven in the month of Ramadan, then they would not be forgiven until the next year unless they witness a special circumstance on the day of Arafah, when they're at Hajj. To give us a sense of, for those who are not going to Hajj, the special opportunity that we have in this month of Ramadan. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in welcoming the holy month of Ramadan as relayed by Amir al-Mu'mineen Alayhi Salam he would tell us what the Prophet would say in welcoming the month of Ramadan. In one of the parts he says شَهْرٌ هُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَفْضَلُ الشُّهُورِ In this month that you have the night of Qadr which is better than a thousand months it's, it resides in a month that Prophet Muhammad has said it is the best month with God. This calls us to reflection on a point, which is this. What is the criterion for making something the best 
or the worst. The best in the eyes of God. The best time of the year, some may say, is spring break. Some may say it's summer break. Some may say it's winter break. Some may say it's Christmas. Some may say it's New Year's. Some may say it's the day, the last day of school. Some may say it's the day we graduate from college. Some may say it's the day of our wedding. Some may, you get the idea, the day of your newborn. What's the best month of the year? What are the best days of the year? What are the best nights of the year? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us. The Holy Quran tells us, Asa and to Hibbu Shayan, Asa and Takrahu Shayan, Wahua Khayrun Lakum, Wasa and to Hibbu Shayan, Wahua Shabun Lakum. It is possible that you may hate something when it is actually good for you, and you may love something when it is actually bad for you. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this wow. spiritual doctor, <laughs> that Imam Ali, peace be upon him, has described as a kind of like a spiritual physician who knows exactly how to use the medicine that he has in order to cure the ailments of the soul. He tells us that the best of months is this month. The best of nights are these nights. The best of days are these days. The best of hours are these hours. The breaths that you take in this month are counted as praising God. Every breath that you take. Your sleep in this month. The sleep that you're using in order to strengthen, in order to come, be able to fast. To strengthen yourself in order to be able to fast. That sleep, the sleep in this month is considered worship. Where else do you get these types of deals in another month? So this is just something to reflect on about the holy month of Ramadan. Hopefully in the coming nights, I'll also take another a few snippets from this sermon and other things as we reflect together. In Munajat Amir al-Mu'mineen, which has been reported among the acts of worship that you do when you visit the mosque of Al-Kufa, Masjid Al-Kufa. This Munajat, I'm not sure if how many of us remember it from the previous years or have seen it recently, but it's divided into two parts. The first part asks God to give us aman, protection, safety. This idea of aman, you may recall, if you remember on, in the commemoration of Ashura, they say that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the brother of Imam Hussein, from a different mother. They had the same father, Imam Ali alayhi salam, but Abu al-Fadl was the son of Umm al-Banin. And he was related through the tribe of his mother, the clan of his mother. He was related in that sense through, his, through the lineage to the tribe that Shimr, may God distance him from his mercy for all of eternity for his crimes. Shimr ibn dil Jawshan was related to him through that tribe. And you remember that he said to him, basically, Abbas, you and your brothers who are from Umm al-Banin, that mother that I'm related to you guys through, you guys are safe. You have the aman. Don't worry, come with us. We're safe. And they say Abu al-Fadl responded, rebuking him. How dare you offer me safety? when the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ has not been granted any safety. In this supplication, Munajat Amir al-Mu'mineen, as it's been called, the first few lines say, O oh God, I ask you for aman. I ask you for safety, for security. What do you mean? What's going on? What type of safety and what security? And each of these lines, which are total a total of eight lines asking for a man. References a verse from the Quran, a different verse in each of the lines. Describing a day in which we are of the utmost need for a man, for safety, for security. This topic tonight that I'm talking about is basically safety and security. It's a priority. Safety and security is such a priority that for us as believers, it comes natural to us when we see the Qur'an describing a situation in which 
our lives are at stake, our consequences, our future is at stake, our eternity is at stake, it makes sense to us. But even more so, even if somebody doesn't believe in God, or has skepticisms, or is an agnostic, or even an atheist, if that person were to simply reflect on what is being said in these words, it will call them to recalculate everything that they've been doing in their lives. And you'll see what I mean as I read this. True, Amir al-Mu'mineen, to him, he sees his Lord. As it's been, he's been asked, as it's been reported, do you see your Lord? Do you see God? And then he would say to them, of course, how would I worship somebody that I do not see? But he would make it clear to them, it is not the physical eyes that see him, but rather the hearts see him in the realities of faith. There's something about the reality that you're able to see with your heart. The question is, how much of that are we going to be able to see as we reflect upon these words with Amir al-Mu'mineen, peace be upon us. Look how it starts. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun illa man ata Allah bi qalbin salim O oh God, I. Let's stop there. Just when you say, O oh God, I. Allahumma. There's a motion, a reaching out, a sense of there's an I, and then I'm reaching out beyond me. A recognition that there's something beyond myself. Furthermore, I'm recognizing that the one beyond myself I am in need of. That's why I'm reaching out to. Right when I say, Allahumma, inni as'aluka. Put aside theology, put aside kalam, put aside detailed discussions on aqidah, on creed, on belief. Simply recognizing that I am not God. God is beyond me. I am not God. I am not responsible for providing for myself. I am not self-sustaining. I am not independent in an absolute way. I am somewhere deep down in need, weak, deficient. And that is why I have to call out beyond myself to someone somewhere. Because I recognize that limitation that I have. I recognize that need that I have. So I say, Allahumma. You may say it primordially. In a sense that is very basic and elementary. You may not realize the details of aqidah, the details of how God and His attributes are one and the same. One essence, indivisible. You may not be thinking of the differences between the Mu'tazila and the Asha'ira and the Shia on how to describe God's essence. You may not be thinking of how to explain God's existence and how He can be beyond perception at the, same, at the same time be a necessity that you cannot do without. You may not be thinking of any of those details. You may not be thinking of how to address the arguments of some atheists and agnostics or skeptics. But you will be feeling this sense deep down that you know you are in need. And so then you say, As'aluka, I ask you. Al-amana yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. I ask you for that safety, that protection on the day in which no wealth and no children will benefit one, will benefit a person. Except, illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. Except for the one who comes to God with a sound heart. Two reflections on this. And by the way, you may be thinking of things about these that I haven't mentioned or will not mention. Each of us 
has our own relationship with God and we nurture it with our reflection, with our connection. One thing that, I, that comes to mind about this is when he says, on that day in which no wealth will benefit us and no children will benefit us. If you really believe in God, you already believe that there are prophets and messengers, there are purposes to be achieved, and that God sends us those who show us how to achieve it, who gives us a prescription, not only in written form, not only as a book, but also as a living personality on earth, either a prophet, a messenger, somebody who's delivering a prescription, or at least somebody who is protecting it and guarding it impeccably, without error. If you already believe that, then you believe the miracle of the Qur'an, when it says something, it must be true. There will be a day, as this verse is telling us, this is a reference to the verse in the Qur'an from Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah 26 from verses 88 to 89. There will be a day in which these things won't benefit us. The only thing that will benefit us is if we come to God with a sound heart. But put aside your beliefs, put aside what you may have taken for granted, you may have grown up to believe, you may have researched and you believe it with full conviction. Put, put that all aside for a moment and imagine that you are sharing this with somebody else that you may have heard has some skepticisms. Somebody that may not even believe in God. And ask them, isn't it possible, isn't it possible that what all these prophets and messengers have been saying or claiming, isn't it possible that it could be true? I mean, sure, you may not buy it. You may not believe it. But maybe you're wrong. Isn't it possible that this is true? Isn't there a serious possibility, at least, in your mind, that there could be a day in which all that wealth and all that prosperity that you're living in this world will not do you any good? Unless you come to God with a clear conscience and a pure heart. <coughs> if the person is sound-minded, they don't have to be a believer in God to realize that it's possible. They don't have to be a follower of Islam to realize that there's a serious possibility that what all these wise individuals, these upright characters throughout history have been talking about could, lo and behold, turn out to be true. And on that day, that person who was on the wrong side of history will be in the most need of that safety and security. So invite that person. Tell them, then come and pray with me. Based on that possibility, just pray with me. Pray for safety and security on that day. A second reflection is, notice that it said, except who comes to God with a pure or sound heart. It didn't say, except who comes to God with a claim to follow Islam. It didn't say, the one who comes to God who used to act as if he was a Muslim. Or who even perhaps believed in Islam. You see, the question is, is our claim enough? Are our actions and our rituals enough? Or is there something else that we need? We need qalbun salim. We need a sound heart. And what's the sound heart all about? At the very least, we can say, we cannot be safe to just assume it's enough for us to say we are Shia and then don't act as the Imams would be approving of us. In some reports, you may have heard many a time, the Imams say, do you think it's enough for you to say we love Ahlul Bayt or to say that we are Shia and then you do not act according to their teachings? Their Shia are the ones who follow their teachings. Their Shia are the ones who were known to be pious, they were known to be righteous. Those were the Shia. So is it enough for us to simply act, simply to claim, without actually having a sound heart? Some people say, my heart is clean, my heart is pure, I have a sincere intention. I don't need to pray, I don't need to fast, I don't need to put on hijab, I don't need to give khums, I don't need to do any of these things. God knows my heart. If that person is truthful, 
then great. However, if you had a completely sound heart, it would mean that you act according to the teachings that God wants us to, to follow. It's a prescription. God has programmed the universe in a way where if we commit sins, it's like we're getting into a car accident. God tells us, look, if you commit a sin, you are creating your own fire with your own hands. من يعمل مثقال ذرة خيرا يره ومن يعمل مثقال ذرة شرا يره In Surah Al-Zalzala, God tells us that if we do an Adam's worth of good, we will see it. And if we do an Adam's worth of evil, we will see it. وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا According to some other verses in the Quran, it talks about how we will find what we have done. What we have done itself, we will see it. Now put aside, regardless whether this is according to the theory of Tajassum al-A'mal, where this is based on a theory that the actions themselves will manifest as bodily form, in bodily forms and physical forms, or whether these are just consequences. Either way, we are seeing the results of what we are doing. If God were to give you a ticket, you would say, okay, why don't God just rip up the ticket? But if the consequence was due to a car accident, and because of that we became injured, it's not a matter of ripping up the ticket. Sure, God has opened up gate, gateways for us, such as the month of Ramadan. Gateways for us, repentance. These are ways in the universe, in the program, in the system for us to make up for what we've done. However, we must realize that the sound heart, neither is it about simply limiting ourselves to the acts of worship and to the claims, nor is it about having what we think or claim to be a sound heart, but we're not following the prescription that God has given us. The second line talks about يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا And with this line I'll connect to Imam Ali alayhi salam because the last word in this line according to the reports of Ahl al-Bayt actually can apply to Imam Ali alayhi salam. In the second line of the eight in the beginning of, the, of this munajat you're asking for protection. The second part of this munajat gives 23, about 23 different lines where we start to try to kind of start to feel the relationship between God and me. The master and the slave. The giver and the one who is given. The one who is rich and the one who is poor. The one who is independent and the one who is dependent. But back to that second line. You ask God for protection, for safety, aman, on the day in which the one who has done wrong, a day when the wrongdoer will bite his hands. Biting his hands here means that he regrets. He feels remorse, he feels regret. This is like a kind of just a figure of speech in Arabic to get, like when somebody's frustrated or from when anxious and they feel like they're regretting, they might start to nibble at their fingers. You will see the wrongdoer will bite his hands saying, I wish I had followed the messenger's way. Or, this is according to one translation. But, اتخذتُ مع الرسول سبيلا I wish that I had taken with the messenger a way, a way with the messenger. A path with the messenger. When you think of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, you know him historically and at the very least you know him through the surviving document the living miracle of the Holy Quran and how the Quran describes him you hear the Quran describing him as one of extraordinary character you hear the Quran describing if you love Allah, then follow me and God will love you. Tell them, 
If you love Allah, then follow me. God will love you. And He will forgive you your sins. But the question comes in the following form. How do we know we're following Prophet Muhammad You see, the surviving community of Islam has conflicting narratives about what Prophet Muhammad wanted us to do and what he said, what he said and what he wanted us to do. So there you see the importance of what is the sabil with that Rasul? What is that way that we want to take along with the Prophet? So that that day comes and we're not of those who are nibbling at our fingers, that we're not biting at our, at our hands out of regret. For why did we not take the path of the Messenger? The question is, how do you know what the path of the Messenger is? Did we put the time and the effort? Did we put the reflection that is needed in order for us to give it a fair chance, to give reason its fair chance, to open up our hearts and our minds, to figure out which surviving narrative is the guarded narrative? Which surviving narrative is the protected message? of Prophet Muhammad which path which path is the path which is considered the path with the Prophet it has been reported in Tafsir al-Qummi that Imam Abi Ja'far which is likely a reference to Imam al-Baqir our fifth Imam he tells us that in explanation of this verse and or in applying this verse to a very important instance and application who is this Ras sabil with the rasul who is this way with the messenger the path with the messenger he tells us sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad يقول يا ليتني اتخذت مع الرسول عليا وليا I wish I would have taken along with the Rasul Ali as the guardian Ali as the guardian This is the one of the most important examples of the way of the Prophet is to know who guarded the way of the Prophet that is Ali and his immaculate descendants. This is the same Ali who toward the end of the sermon of the Prophet ﷺ or throughout the sermon and part of the sermon, he asked the Rasul ﷺ, what is the best thing that we can do in this month? And the Prophet would tell him, the, most, the best thing you can do in this month is to have piety when it comes to what God has commanded us. That prescription that's prescription for spiritual health. The most important and pivotal thing that we can do in this month is al wara on maharim Allah. This is the Ali who at the end of that sermon as it's reported, the Prophet ﷺ started to cry. You would see tears down the Prophet's cheeks. Why? They say Imam Ali asked him, Ya Rasulullah, ma yubkik? Faqala Ya Ali, abki lima mustahallu minka fi hadha shah. I'm crying because of what they will consider to be okay for them to do with you in this month. Ka'ani bika wa anta tusalli li rabbih. Wa qad imba'atha ashqan He starts to put the picture, imagine dear brothers and sisters, come back with me, back into those days when Imam Ali, peace be upon him, in that night, imagine Prophet Muhammad is seeing what's going to happen in the future, he's seeing what this, this evil man will do to the commander of the faithful Ali, to the guardian of the message. He sees something so vicious, something so evil will be committed in this month. What evil action will be committed in this sacred month? 
Imagine, he says, I am crying for what will happen to you in this month. As if I can see that person, that wicked man, striking you in this month. Such that the blood will gush out and it will drench your beard, O oh, Ali. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, what do you think Imam Ali was worried about in those moments? They say Imam Ali would say, he would say, is that out of protecting my faith? Or is that while my, my faith is protected, what's he worried about? He's only worried about his faith. He's not worried about his own personal life. He's worried about protecting Islam. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, come with me to those moments in that night in which Imam Ali, peace be upon him, they say he was at one of his daughter's homes. He was getting a bite to eat. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, how humble Imam Ali, peace be upon him, was. How humble he was that he wouldn't want to have more than one type of food and put before him. Imagine Imam Ali, peace be upon him, as he's worshipping God in that night, as he's dedicating himself to Allah. Imagine when the time of Fajr prayer comes near, and he starts to head out toward the mosque of the a mosque in that area where he living, where he's living. Imagine as he goes toward the mosque, what's he looking at? They say that there were some animals, some geese that were making noise. What were these geese saying? Can you imagine, dear brothers and sisters, maybe the hearts of human beings were too hard to feel what was going to happen. But maybe God had made these animals feel what was going to happen. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, as Imam Ali heads towards the mosque, does he see this person sleeping? Does he start to gently try to wake him, wake them up? May God have mercy on you. Come to the prayer. I'm inviting you to come to the prayer. Come to the meeting with your Lord. Imam Ali imagined that he sees the enemy. He sees this person that he used to take care of. Imagine this person, how ungracious he was. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, they were plotting to strike Imam Ali. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters. صلى الله عليك يا أبا الحسن يا أمير يا علي بن أبي طالب السلام عليك يا أمين الله في أرضه السلام عليك يا ميثاق الله الذي السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين. Peace be upon you, O Imam Ali. Peace be upon you, O Commander of the Faithful. Oh, Imam, when they struck you, the pillars of guidance fell down. Oh, Imam, when they struck you, the firmest handle fell down. <laughs> ألا نعمة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل بيت محمد الذي وانقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين وسبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين هو الله يسكر for the sake of Imam Ali for the sake of Prophet Muhammad and his pure progeny 
We ask you, O Allah, to accept the little that we have offered, to perfect it with your blessings. We ask you, O Allah, to move us into the light always. We ask you, O Allah, to give us the knowledge, the love, and the will to do what will bring us closer to you. We ask you to give guidance to all the misguided, to heal the sick, to give support to all of those who are supporting your cause across the globe. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us a good end in this life and not to let us leave this world until you are pleased with us. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make up for all of our shortcomings with your own perfection and excellence. And the last of our prayers is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad